Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Wanted to talk to you today about something that I've been meaning to talk about for a little while. I've mentioned it in passing here and there on some of my different broadcasts, but Brother Ben had asked me to elaborate on this, and I kept forgetting. I have a bunch of topics I have already written out for different... That reminds me, let me grab my notebook while I'm thinking about it. Uh, For different broadcasts that I want to do. So much to do in so little time, right? The topic of this message is how do I get back to zero? You know, we've heard it said, I know I've said it, and it's it's not exactly accurate where where people will say God is holy. Well, that's true, but it's actually an understatement. The Bible says that God is thrice holy. In the book of the Revelation of who? Jesus Christ. Let me find that real quick. Revelation 4, 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Yeah, I want to give you scripture for it. God is holy. He's thrice holy. Right? And I was thinking, how does sin enter the presence of a thrice holy God? And the answer is, it cannot. Well, we remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross. And the Bible says, God laid on him the iniquity of us all, right? And at that time, the Lord cries out, my God. My God, why hast thou forsaken me in the King James? I'm trying to find that actual passage. I'm not seeing it right now where God laid on him the iniquity of of us all. Some of these interfaces that you use for I have an app for that don't always have really good search engines so then you end up having to defer. Hold on one second. I wasn't expecting to talk to him about this this morning. This is just on the fly. Which is just the way I like to do it. And and now my browser has disappeared. I haven't had my morning cup of coffee. So the elevator may not be going all the way to the top right now. (laughs) I had to do KJV. Wow. 
Why did it put a period there? Okay. And I was thinking, how do you get back to zero? People don't get it because they'll go, oh, well, uh, as long as we're 50-50, you know, every religion of the world kind of teaches that as long as we're 50-50, no, 51, 51%, 51%. Well, I think some of them do teach 50-50 is the coin toss and God gets to decide, you know, whether or not you're good enough to get in. And hopefully, this is what most people think, and hopefully your good outweighs your bad. So they go, well, I don't kick cats. <laughs> I don't kick dogs. You know, I've never murdered anybody. So I'm, I must be okay. Oh, that's why I couldn't find it. I was looking in the New Covenant. I know I reiterated it, though, in the New Covenant. But we'll go. Good old Isaiah, the prophet. Isaiah 53, 6. All, like, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, this is speaking of Jesus, this prophecy, the iniquity of us all. At the time that was written, it was prophecy. We know for us now, it is history. Now it's history. But then, when this was written, it was prophecy. And so, if it wasn't for this, <laughs> This is what people mean. If it wasn't for this, we as believers get it. I'm preaching to the choir. You should already be getting fired up while I'm idling here. <laughs> like a motor idling. Uh, it, it's building up, right? God laid on him the iniquity of us all. People don't understand why we rejoice over it. Honey, this is such good news. Let me tell you, it is such good news. If you haven't figured it out yet, because remember, going back to the book of the Revelation of who? Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. So how would, I'll just use myself as an example. My raggedy behind. <laughs> as, as we used to say back in the day, the raggedy behind. Going to enter the presence of a thrice holy God. How is that supposed to happen? That's why when you see people put it on the person that we have to repent as though contrition, which is what they're using it for, or attrition, this godly sorrow. Being sorry for your sin is not going to save you. Now, is it wrong to be sorry? No. That's a good place to start. The only thing is, most people who start there stay there. What do I mean by that? Because they just keep going. It's this whole Catholic perpetual, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry thing. But sorry, don't change it. We need a change. <laughs> and so then most people go, well, yes, I'm going to change. I'm, no, I'm not going to sin anymore. Well, that's, that's a good attitude to have. That's a good hope. But the fact is, how do you change your nature? See, this is what they mi missing. They put the change and the emphasis of change on behavior. That ain't good enough. It ain't good enough. Changing your behavior is not going to get her done. It's not going to get the job done. Because if we, as the Bible says, are all together, Born in sin and shaped in iniquity. How then do we get back to zero? How do we get back to sinlessness? And this is what everybody misses in these false religions. How do we get back to zero? 
God is thrice holy. And not one drop, not one speck of sin can be on us to enter his presence. How do we get back to zero? Well, scriptures like this, Isaiah 53, 6. God has laid on him. Who's the him? Jesus. The iniquity of us all. Oh, thank God for Jesus. That's a play on words. Because Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God Almighty. Manifested in the flesh. The Bible says. He. Prepared himself a body. He made an earth suit. Came down here. The Bible says. In the likeness of sinful flesh. And the Bible says. In him dwell the fullness. Of the Godhead bodily. Well. I don't think it says in your NIV. I think they took it out. It might be in the in the footnotes, but then they put an asterisk there like that wasn't really in the scripture. It was added. That's what that implies. But people, hey, you can show them all these little weird things that they did with that particular version. And some people say perversion. Excuse me, I've been meaning to find a little bit better dictionary because one day I'll go on a tangent about this. But right now I'm using Merriam-Webster, not sponsored. Iniquity. The quality of being unfair or evil. Interesting, they're doing unfair. It's like if I'm thinking about iniquity, I'm not thinking about unfair. Even though that would definitely be a part of it. You know, and then we were reading through Proverbs the other day on my podcast, For the Lonely, where the Bible talks about several times how the Lord hates a false balance. And that would mean, just like you see here, uh, of course, my radio alarm decided to go crazy right there. Apologies. It's not even supposed to just, it's supposed to beep. I, you know, some of this high tech stuff gets on my funion. I've read the manual and I still don't remember how to do that alarm on that thing. I want to turn it off. I don't even need it. But it goes off every day. I had it fixed where it wasn't doing it. The power went out, jacked it up. And, and now I got to go find the manual, play with it again, get it back right. Anyway, as we, where was I? Okay. I was talking about Proverbs and how the Bible says a, f- a false balance the Lord hates, but just weights are his delight. They're an abomination. For, for, in, in, the Lord, he don't play about cheating folk. That's why you do better to do better than your word. Like if you promise somebody, you know... <laughs> $20 for cutting the line, and then you, you know, as long as they did the work, you're not supposed to play with them with that. You're supposed to pay them. The Bible says a workman is worthy of his hire. The biblical principles. You, you do better than throwing a little tip. Here's a little tip for you on top of it. Because uh, he hates that. And the Bible talks about it as a recompense coming for all this imbalance that people have done to other people. And I, I don't perceive that's just one category of things. This is a whole bunch of stuff. Ain't even on the radar screen on how they have cheated the world and tricked the world. And when I say the world, in this instance, I'm talking about all the people in it. 
The full definition of plural iniquities, gross injustice, wickedness, a wicked act or thing. And then it says sin. Synonyms, corruption, debauchery, depravity, immorality, inquitiousness. Did I pronounce that right or did I butcher that? Let me see here. Oh, excuse me. Yes, I butchered it. <laughs> this is funny. Iniquitous. Now I get okay. Let it go back. One second. One thing I don't like about this particular app, you cl click on a, a synonym and it completely boots you out of where you were. Another good reason to find another one. Okay. Yeah, iniquitous. I don't know how I missed that. All right, vice. Libertinage. That's an interesting word. I'm going to have to click on that one. Libertinism. Licentiousness. Profligacy. Did I butcher that one too? Profligacy and sin. So let's go to libertinage. Libertinage. Libertinism. I have to go to that one because it doesn't give you the definition under libertinage. The quality or state of being. The behavior of a libertine. <laughs> Example, a group of urban bohemians who were better known for their libertinism than for their intellectualism. And it just gives, and it says first known use 1611. And it just goes back into debauchery and decadent, oh, decadency. Hmm. Is that why they call them liberals? Not look, I'm not picking. That word is in there: li liberty, libertinism. Hmm. Interesting. Libertinage is connected to corruption. That was interesting. The other one was here was um, profligacy. Pro, yeah, profligacy, and from the word. Profligate, a religious leader who railed against pro the profligacy of the nation's decadent aristocrats. So I go to that word, profligate, a widely extravagant, widely extravagant, like profligate spending. Completely given up to dissipation and licentiousness, shamelessly immoral, leading a profligate life. So it's connected to iniquity, being wasteful, high rolling, extravagant, spendthrift, squandering, prodigal. So we remember Jesus talking about that. So we have an idea 
when God laid on him the iniquity of us all. All of this stuff is interconnected with that. Any which way you went with these words that connected to iniquity is is how do we get back to zero? People will say, well, as long as I start good and doing good right now, no, sweetheart, that ain't going to erase your past. And you say, well, what about the, the brand new baby? He is altogether born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Sin is your nature. That's the problem. This is what most of these religions do not get. Sin is the nature, the fallen nature of man. Now, how do we fix it? Oh, we can't. The first error is thinking you could. Because the Bible tells us that by one man, Adam, the first Adam, sin entered the world. So, how was that ever going to be undone? I think, let's see, it's in the Apocrypha. Let's see if I can find it. Oh, yes, this is definitely one I want to read. Second Ezra three twenty one in the Apocrypha. Well, the first Adam, bearing a wicked heart, transgressed and was overcome. And so be all they that are born of him. If you human, you were born with a wicked heart. How do we get back to zero? Second Edges 3.26. And in all things did even as Adam and all his generations had done, for they also had a wicked heart. Second is just 430. For the grain of evil seed hath been sown in the heart of Adam from the beginning. And how much ungodliness hath it brought up Unto this time, and how much shall it yet bring forth until the time of threshing come? But this is the passage I wanted to go to. Those other two definitely cover. Second Edges 748. O thou Adam, what hast thou done? For though it was thou that sinned, Thou art not fallen alone, but we all that come from thee. That says it all. And we hear, yet we hear preacher after preacher after preacher to stand up there and act like each person did it to themselves. No, the Bible is just showing you when it says all has sinned and come short of the glory of God. It is showing you that, baby, that's your nature. But they don't read it that way. They don't say it that way. They make it seem like every man fell. No, every man was born fallen since Adam. I told you the Lord is not on a search and destroy. He's on a search and rescue mission. If you thought of sin as a disease and you had two parents, you know how they had a thing where uh one parent might carry a genetic marker and then another parent carry the same genetic marker of the male and female. And then together, that child 
born from them will have this disease. Well, there you go. There's our condition. Two parents come together and make another sinner. That's just how it goes. Because of the fall. The second Adam, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, paid with his own blood. God manifested in the flesh. The most beautiful sneak attack in history against the devil to rescue man from the clutches of the evil one. So how do we get back to zero? We have to believe on the perfect lamb that was slain and then a transaction happens. We are washed in the blood of the lamb. We're made white as snow and as far is as the east is from the west, the Lord removes removes our iniquity because he laid it all on his Christ on Calvary. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for paying for my sin. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. This is why the Bible says God cannot hold them guiltless for rejecting his son. So to answer the question, how do you get back to zero? Sin cannot enter the presence of a thrice holy God, holy Holy, holy is the Lord, God Almighty. You have to be washed in the blood of the Lamb, but without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. And Hebrews goes over this and leaves it without any ambiguity. If you read it and pay attention, the language is so specific. If anybody rejects the Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, is none of his. As it says in Hebrews, we see they could not enter in. Speaking of the people walking in the wilderness, the children that were promised, the Hebrews that were promised, the promised land. They could not enter in. Why? Because of unbelief. If you do not believe on Jesus, you ain't none of his. And you have to be trusting in that and clinging to that and relying on that to receive his salvation. What Jesus has done, not your filthy rags works. The Bible says, our rag, our yeah, we should say it that way. <laughs> but but it says our righteousness is that filthy rags before the Lord. It's rags, filthy rags. You know, it's one thing to have rags. You know, just be have some tattered clothing. It's another to have filthy rags. And yet people want to, uh, man, take their righteousness and put it up and offer it. You're going to come up woefully short on Judgment Day if you're doing that mess. No, sir. For by grace are you say, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Don't try it. It is a fool's attempt 
to think that their righteousness is going to satisfy the Lord. No. We got to be washed in the blood of the Lamb to be converted. And then after that, sanctification begins. And that's our reasonable service back under the Lord to live clean, to come on out the pig pen. Why? We're not pigs anymore. We have a new nature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold. Stop, look, take notice. All things. Not some, not most, not many. All things have become new. And so then what do we do? Now, as believers, we renew our minds on the word of God to develop within us the mind of Christ to understand, I don't play in pig pens anymore. I'm not a pig. I have a new nature. And the good news is, easy for me to say, and the good news is, our Lord didn't set a time limit on it. So we don't have to feel pressure. Now, I'm not saying that so you stay in the pig pen. The point is, we look into this word, into the perfect law of liberty, and we regulate ourselves according to the Holy Spirit and his word and our relationship, just like a little baby, and then they take, they start crawling before they can walk, right? And then they start walking. And before you know when they run, and then you can't catch them. Well, that's the way we're supposed to be in Christ when we're growing up. First we're crawling. Your little baby can't do nothing for himself or herself when they come out. Nothing. They are completely reliant upon their parents for their sustenance and for their survival. And then they are suckled, and then they start eating a little table food, right? Well, you know, the baby food, but back in the day, and they still do this in other countries, by the way, where they can't afford baby food in a jar. They chew up the food. You chew it up and get it soft and put it in the baby's mouth. If you didn't, your baby would starve. And then the baby start growing and they do their little baby steps and they walk. And before you know it, it's man style. They're on their own. And the whole part of you raising your children, as you already know, those of you who have done it, those of you who are doing it, is to prepare them what? To be on their own. For the day when you're not here. For the day when you can't care for them anymore. For the day when they may be caring for you. And it's the same thing in Christ. It don't change. We are born into his forever ever family, forever family, through faith. And once we're in his family, we're his child. We got his name. And just like if you had parents <laughs> that didn't play around and that were sober and vigilant about you, they'd be like, don't you, don't you give me a bad name. I tan your hide. <laughs> That's my name. You know, let me just pick Smith. God bless all the Smiths out there. You a Smith. You're not going to embarrass me. You're not there acting no fool. Well, well, if we do that, if we then be an evil, <laughs> know how to do that with our children, how much more? Our Heavenly Father going to keep us in check through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why... I know that people, I tell you, I, I got big questions. I just don't understand something. When those of us who are saved know good and darn well, as they used to say, good and darn well, that you cannot go out there in that world and live like the devil and think there is no chastisement from the Lord when you his child. Just like your mama and your daddy back in the day, caught you doing something, if they roll, as they say, roll up in the cut, if they 
if they came around that corner and caught you doing something, oh, your life flashed. If you're like six, seven, eight years old, your life flashed. That little blip you got, you knew you was in trouble. How much more? Our Heavenly Father. That's why I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if, if these people do know God because all of us that are believers, you already know. Before you even think about doing the thing, the Holy Spirit's dealing with you already. That's why the Bible says in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, he was going to write a new covenant on a, a hearts, not like the old. In fact, let me go there. And I want to paraphrase it. Jeremiah, a great prophet of God. 31. Thirty-one. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. That covers it. That's all of them. All twelve. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers. In the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Now see, this is this is what I was just talking about. The law is on our hearts. So when we get ready to do something or have just done something, the Lord is already dealing with us. Holy Spirit, I told you, the Holy Spirit is dealing with you before you think about doing something wrong. All the believers who are born again and filled with the Holy Spirit know, say amen, because you know it's true. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor. And every man his brother say and know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, say the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity. I will forgive their iniquity. I will forgive their iniquity. And I will remember their sin. How much? How, how long? No more. No more. So understand, you either have a new covenant or no covenant. That's why these clowns that's on here, I'm going to call them clowns. On this note, they're clowns. They're in error, grave error. It's right here in the book. You either have a new covenant or you, don't have, a no, you have no covenant. Hebrews is written to Hebrews. Hebrews is written to Hebrews, the 12 tribes. And it's when his people return to knowledge of self, by the way, says so in chapter 8. That they don't make the mistake of thinking they got to run back and jump under the law. And that they start keeping that to be saved. See, people say when you say, well, you ought to keep the law to be saved, that we tell the people to go break the law. No, the law was fulfilled in Christ. He's the only one that could fulfill it. The only one. Why? First of all, the criteria is sinless perfection. And since we are all together born in sin, just like I read to you, Adam, every person since, born in iniquity, born in sin, how do you get back to zero? That's why Christ is the line of demarcation. We used to have it in history here before they, the devils messed with it. B.C., which meant before Christ, then you had the cross, and then you had A.D., oh, the resurrection, by the way, because he's not still hanging on the cross. He was crucified, buried, and resurrected on the third day. So you have the resurrection, and then you have A.D., Anno Domini, Latin for in the year of our Lord. 
They can change whatever they want to change because you want to pin them down. What was it before what you changed it to? And watch them get a lump in their throat. You say, excuse me, Professor, excuse me. Uh, This BCE before the Common Era, what was it before that? Before they changed it. And watch them, watch them get angry. Watch, you can see the horns come out of their head. Well, I don't know what you mean. They're going to play crazy. Oh, you got a PhD, but you don't know what I mean. It was before Christ. Thank you very much. They can play games. I'm telling y'all. If you have Jesus, you won the game. Okay. For you, now the whole thing is about working out your salvation and then telling others about Jesus. That's it. When I say working it out, it's like you're not. You're not working on your salvation. You have it. So it's like having a shirt that had wrinkles. You're not creating the shirt. You're getting the wrinkles out of it. Okay? You're working it out. Because this is new to us. We're new creatures. What happened with that baby? Yeah? Just like I said, we've got to be totally self-reliant. Excuse me, totally reliant on the Lord. We have to be totally reliant on the Lord, just that, that that little infant that can do nothing for him or herself. Nothing. They can't even hold a bottle yet. They can't even hold their mom's breast yet. Right? That's it. They are totally reliant upon the tender love of their parents to nurture them, protect them, until they get stronger. And every day, every day, in little ways, and you don't see it initially. Every day, little changes are happening. Oh, come on now. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. Every day, little changes are happening. And before you know it, you got a big, strong man or a big, strong woman. And you said, where did the time go? And they, they're raising their own. And they're going out and having more children. What is that? Going out winning other souls. See, the problem is a lot of these people, sadly, a lot of them, they don't get strong in the faith before they go out. See, this is where discipleship is supposed to come in. Where you get under another believer that's solid in Christ and teaches you correctly so that you grow up strong in the faith and then you can go out. And win souls. And you ain't going to get shipwrecked. I see a lot of these babes. They go out there. And they forget. Well we forget too. That there's wolves out here. In sheep's clothing. Pretending to be believers. And they're absolute devils. And they'll shipwreck these people's faith. Because they were babes. Babes ain't ready. To go out and handle wolves. Did you hear me? Babes are not ready. To handle wolves. If we understand that in the natural, why we don't understand that spiritually? These babes in Christ got to grow up a little bit. That's why I keep telling them, sit down. I understand you're on fire for Jesus and you want to share your faith. But you got to understand there's people out here that's trying to destroy you. They want to shipwreck your faith. And you need to be around other believers that are stronger and have been through some things that can say, okay, watch out for this and look out for that. Somewhere we lost that. And I I think it's a part of the American culture in particular. Not to understand you need to find the elders, people who've been living this thing longer than you. Good men and women of God that if you want to know the biggest tale, there's two things you look for in particular. Now, they're not always a hundred because there's some slicksters out here. The first is always they're magnifying the Lord. All the glory, all the praise, all the honor goes to him. Okay. Number one. Number two. They ain't about money. 
You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, that don't mean we're supposed to let the man or woman of God starve either. Okay? That ain't right either. You're going to sit down and you're just eating at folk table and eating at their table and eating at their table and don't never leave, not even a five spot, before you, before you get up and walk out the door. Yeah, that would get old real quick, right? All I'm saying, I ain't asking you for nothing. This is the point. If you see somebody that's only about money or like 80% of their time <laughs> or 70 or even 50 is spent begging for money, watch out. Watch out. Okay? Uh, YouTube don't cost anything. It's our time to come on here. I'm doing it for me. For me, I'm doing it. Because I can. It's a work of faith and a labor of love. But Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. Now, some people do have physical brick and mortar ministries, and that stuff costs money. Lights, gas, taxes, all of that stuff, it does cost money. So if you see a preacher up here and he got a real church and he is a real man or a real woman of God and you you know you're verifying it, because their spirit bears witness, the Holy Spirit in you, and you're not getting any checks, and you are receiving, and you are growing. When I say checks, I'm talking about checks in your spirit. Hey, something ain't right here. So you're receiving, you're growing. You should, when you can, bless them with some form of uh, remuneration as an offering, as a free will offering, to say thank you for what you received. So, because uh, I'm noticing there's this, this thing happening where people don't act like they should be doing anything to give to anybody. And I'm like, that ain't right. I know tithing is not for the church. We've been lied to about that. Tithing was for the nation of Israel. It was never uh, for the church. But, but offering is for the church. God loves a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. So that's for the church. That's right to do. So that, uh, you know, it's, it's like I think there was a, there's a passage in Scripture where Paul, no, they weren't giving him anything. No, they weren't. People weren't giving him anything. So he went back to making tents. He was a tent maker, and he went back to making tents so he could continue to preach the gospel. Otherwise. He wouldn't have been able to eat because people weren't giving him anything so that he could just do ministry. Jesus, some some people that uh, are men and women of God, you want to bless them so they can just sit there and teach. And they don't have to go work a 40. Because if you go work a 40 and you have to come back and sit down and teach, you ain't got much time. You got to get your rest. You throw a family in there. You got family. That takes away time. See what I'm saying? So if you if you go, hey, we give to them and they can take care of themselves where they can just sit here and preach and teach, we got more access, more time. So that's a part of it, you know, uh, as far as ministry. That's where you have these churches. If they're good men and women of God, I, I know that there are some absolute devils. Absolute devils. But I told you, I got a meme for that, right? 10,000 counterfeits do not invalidate the genuine article. Just make sure you have the genuine article. Those counterfeits are going to get judged. They're not getting away with anything. It just looks that way. And since they look, if they <laughs> if they playing with the things of God, hold on. See, I don't know what they thinking. They should have been reading this book a little more careful. The Bible says judgment begins first. Where? At the house of the Lord. So if you're a wolf, you heard me. If you're a wolf in the house of the Lord, who you think getting judged first? And you're starting to see. I heard one man talking about this. You're starting to see a lot of these people. They ain't even 50. They ain't even 60. Dropping dead.
And then you start hearing all about their life. Now, I know some of these people, I don't just judge every, you know, by what people say negative because then all these devils will come out. If they were re- a genuine person, but if they were alive, there was already controversy. There was already. So, you know, we'll find out on the other side who's lying and who ain't. Because listen to me, these people who's coming forward, they better not be lying. Because the Bible speaks, these six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. He mentions lying twice. In that passage, these six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. He talks about a lying tongue and a false witness that speaks lies in that passage. Well, how you think the truth, which is King Jesus, he is the truth, is going to feel about lies. I don't know. I I shake my head. Okay. You know, this is, uh, this ain't no game. I think you do better. You do better to just be, what do they call it, agnostic, you know, or just a, uh, I'm saved and I'm just going to go sit over here and read my Bible and, and pray. Then to get up and mislead the people of God, you know, everybody makes mistakes. I'm not talking about a mistake. Mistake is no malintent. See, God looks at intent. Big time. Oh, yes, he do. If you come out, you make an honest mistake. You know, you said something was in, you know, Isaiah when it was in Jeremiah. You know, that's no malintent. Well, they got people out here twisting scriptures, man, deliberately to deceive people and shut up the kingdom of heaven. What do you think is going to happen to this pe- these people? This ain't no joke. This ain't no game. I remember when I first set out to come on YouTube and and speak a little bit about this, that, and the other thing. I stressed. I sweated. Because I knew this wasn't no joke and it wasn't no game. Because you're talking to God's people. And you better be right <laughs> when you're talking to God's people. Even if you're just sharing you know, your experiences as a believer in the Lord and what you're going through, and you start talking about Scripture, you better be right. Because people are going to believe you and receive it. Man, it ain't no small matter. So, I think that's about all I have to say on this. Matter. The only way you can get back to zero is to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Because we come into this world already sinners. We don't fall and become sinners. We are already sinners, altogether born, shaping, woven. It was our nature. And that's why you have to be born again. So you have an exchange of natures. Now the problem is, that remains the lingering problem that we're groaning for and yearning for is our new body that will not have any remembrance, any connection to sin at all. It'll be brand new. We have the new nature, but we don't have the new body. And that's why we have these groanings within our flesh yearning for the day. Even though life is meant to be enjoyed and the Lord has given us many wondrous and glorious things here um, in his creation, 
we still yearn for the day for full and complete restoration where this mortality puts on immortality and this corruption puts on incorruption. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Be blessed, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. Amen.